Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode, and I'm thrilled to have back with me Erica Salmon Byrne, president of Ethosphere, because we're going to talk about my favorite Ethosphere topic, world's most ethical companies. We had a release within the past week or so of the announcement of the awards with that incredibly long-winded introduction. First of all, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me back, Tom. It's my pleasure, as this is also one of my favorite topics. So could you give us an overview of this year at really some 40,000 foot highlights and we'll take a little bit deeper dive. Yep, absolutely. As you mentioned, we released the 2023 class of World's Most Ethical Companies honorees on the 13th of March. So just about a week ago, a week or so ago now, 135 companies on the list this year, 19 countries and 46 industries. Great diversity of country representation, great diversity of industry representation. We have six companies on the list who have been every year. And we have all 17 of the years that we've been doing this. And we have seven brand new honorees, some great new folks that we wel- that uh, we welcomed to the honoree community this year. And then of course, some long-termers that have been around since the beginning. So the, what does the recognition itself mean? It's really interesting, Tom, because I've asked a lot of honoree companies about that. And I particularly liked the way one company phrased it to me when I was talking to them last week. And they said, look, There are lots and lots of times that companies get recognized for messing up. Um, They didn't use the phrase messing up, but this is a family pod. So I will use the phrase messing up and let everybody fill in the blank as to what they might have actually said. But there are so many, there are so few ways right now that a company that is really invested in doing business the right way gets recognized for doing business the right way. And this is one of those ways. If you look at what goes into the criteria of the evaluation process, we're looking at your culture. We're looking at the ways you are thinking about your impact on the communities in which you operate. We are looking at your ethics and compliance program initiatives. We are looking at the way you are governing your programs, both at the board level and at the C-suite level. We're looking at your leadership and your reputation. And when you combine all those things together, those are pieces of running your business that rarely get recognized. And so it's really lovely to have an opportunity to recognize people who are doing those things really well and have a chance to celebrate the work that they're doing. So you're asking questions, but you're also asking for documentation to be Mm -hmm. submitted so that documentation can be evaluated. Could you speak a little bit about the evaluation process you and your board go through? Yeah, absolutely. So the world's most ethical companies process starts with the ethics quotient questionnaire. And Tom, you and I had the pleasure of talking in the fall last year about some of the changes that we made to the EQ when we opened the world's most ethical companies process. And so we changed the EQ with our methodology advisory board on an annual basis. In 2023, we changed about 40% of the survey Um, including adding some things that it turned out the Department of Justice has a real interest in. So in August, we added a question around clawbacks. We added a couple of questions around incentives and evaluations and performance management. We added questions around disciplinary calibration, all things that then showed up in the new DOJ guidance that came out earlier this month. So we really try to stay ahead of best practices, things that are coming on the horizon, pushing the bar forward in terms of practices themselves. And a company that's interested in doing the world's most ethical companies process will start by filling out the survey. Actually, I'll take a step back. Many of them will start by looking at the red line of this year's survey versus last year's survey, which is something that is openly available to anybody who's interested in looking at the methodology we use from a questions perspective. And then if they think they've got what it takes, they will then take the survey and then they submit documentation to support particular pieces of the survey itself. So We look at ESG reports, we look at records of manager training, we look at your communications and training plans, we look at some of your board governance documents, different pieces that will allow us to verify as an internal team that you are actually doing the things that you say you are doing in your survey responses. So there's a self-submitted survey piece, there's the verification piece that the team inside Ethosphere does, and then based on how all of that comes out from a scoring perspective, we come up with the companies that are on the list. And the way we do the scoring piece of it is we will look at your performance in a grouping with your peers. So if you are a small Colombian manufacturing company, we are not going to compare you to a large uh, Irish manufacturing company because you're operating in very different jurisdictions. We will try to, as much as we possibly can, do some peer-to-peer comparisons. And then the companies that rise to the top are the ones that are selected to make the list every year. Let's maybe take a little bit deeper dive into the evaluation framework, because not only is that important for the awards evaluation, but I see this as just a fabulous way for companies 
to self-evaluate themselves. Mm -hmm. Use this literally on an annual basis with the question. So I would really see if we could go through each of the categories, governance, leadership, and reputation, culture of ethics, ethics and compliance programs, and then environmental and societal impacts. Because I just find the entire world's most ethical process so valuable to the greater compliance community. Yeah. Yeah. And we've really designed it that way, Tom, on purpose. It's, I like to say that, and I've had multiple compliance officers tell me that their best self-assessment work is just reading the red line of our survey every year and asking themselves, how would I answer this new question from Atmosphere? So let's take, for example, investigations processes. If you look at the survey itself, so globally speaking, across all the categories of the ethics quotient, we're asking now about 210 questions. Tom, if you and I were having this conversation 10 years ago, at that point, we were asking about 100 questions. So the survey has absolutely grown exponentially over the course of the last several years as more and more pieces of this analysis become important to the process. So let's pick on one, one specific section. So if you look at the investigations questions in the EQ, we're going to be asking you questions about whether or not you have a written investigation process. How are you supporting your investigators? Are you providing them with templates? Are you training them on how to do investigations? Are you training all your investigators together? Or does ethics and compliance have a bucket of investigators, that HR has a bucket of investigators, and fraud has a bucket of investigators, and none of them ever talk to each other? I bet you can guess which of the answers from our perspective is better in terms of that. We're going to look at the way that you are deciding discipline. So that is a new set of questions that we added this year. If you look at the annotated version of the EQ, you'll see that we added a series of questions on how you're making sure that you are disciplining equally across the organization. Tom, when you and I talk about our culture data, you know that organizational justice is a huge piece of the puzzle when it comes to whether or not people are comfortable raising their hand. It's a question of whether or not they feel like something would really happen and that thing that happens would be fair. On the programmatic side, one of the ways you figure that out is whether or not you're calibrating discipline across the organization. And then who's responsible for implementing discipline? Does ethics and compliance have a role in that? Are you auditing to make sure that remediation that was suggested as part of the investigations process actually happens? So the idea behind the EQ is you could take a section like that and you could hand it to the person inside your company that is responsible for investigations process. And you could say, how would you answer these questions? Are we comfortable that we are doing the things we should be doing to say that we have a good credit worthy person? So how are these criteria, or rather, how are organizations selected? Is there a minimum score? Is it a bell curve? Or is it simply if you've got 100 applicants that are worthy based upon the scores, you may consider giving 100 such designations? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. If you look at the size of the list every year, Tom, you'll see it's fluctuated. So last year we had 136 companies. The year before that, we had 128 companies. So we don't go into the world's most ethical companies review process saying, this year we shall have 135 companies. And when we get to 135 companies, even if the 136th is excellent, we shall not put that, that 136 company on the list. We look at the pool every year uh, and we make sure that we are celebrating companies who are really advancing the dialogue when it comes to our core thesis, which is that good ethics is good business. The we do this podcast several times a year, and one of the times we do it is at the start of the process. Yeah. I think it's important not simply to publicize the applications, but to really talk about the process. And it, I see this as an incredibly valuable tool. Certainly, it'd be great to, to win the designation, but this is so much more. Could we talk a little bit about how companies can use the application process, even if they're not selected for the the designation and how they can even use that going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Because because I couldn't agree with you more, Tom. And that's certainly something that we hear from our community of companies is that going through the process itself is a valuable exercise. So I think there's three ways in which you can think about the value above and beyond getting it in of going through the process. One is the nature of the application process is cross-functional. We designed the survey in such a way that you have to go talk to your corporate secretary to answer the questions. You have to go talk to your head of IR to answer the questions. You have to go talk to your HR director and your procurement team and your ESG team. You have to build a cross-functional set of relationships in order to be able to complete the survey itself. And so one of the things that I always encourage people who are looking at the survey for the first time to say to themselves is, are there questions on this survey I can't answer without going and speaking to somebody else? 
do I know who that person is? And if not, why not? Because all of those relationships are critical relationships to operating your program well. And so if you don't have those relationships right now, completing the world's most ethical company survey is a really great reason to go to your corporate secretary and say, hey, we're going to throw our hat in the ring for this thing and I'm going to need your help. And let's, you know, let's start that dialogue and let's build that relationship. So that's piece one. Piece two is if you wind up in front of the Department of Justice, the Department of Justice has said that they're going to look at the quality of your program at the time you come in to, to disclose misconduct and at the time the misconduct happened. What's a really great way of documenting the way your program was at the time the misconduct happened? Having filled out the ethics quotient. There's a record of how your program was functioning. If you're dealing with an issue from 2017 and you took the EQ in 2017, you've got a record of what your program looked like because it is a comprehensive set of questions on program structure. And, and then the last piece is something that we've been doing for the last several years, which is your scorecard. So every single company that goes through the process gets a scorecard that shows them on a category by category basis how they performed against the honoree class, whether they made the list or not. And so you can see and you can then use internally inside your organization. Let's say, hypothetically speaking, you're a company that scored, you, kicked, you knocked it out of the park on impacts. You scored in the 80s on impacts and you scored a 60 on culture. That 60 on culture probably kept you off the list because that's not, that culture is 20% of your score. And so if you struggled on culture because nobody inside your organization has allowed you to measure your employees' willingness to speak up, that's a really fantastic tool that you can then use inside your organizations to advocate for change. Now let's put big smiles on our faces because we get to talk about the most fun part. And that's the ethics premium. Yeah. And I know... We're not supposed to say the money shot is what it's all about, but the money shot means a lot here. Yeah. And it's a number <clears throat> that struck me the first time I saw this in 2017. And I still feel that same sort of, I don't want to say awe, but just excitement when I see the ethics premium. So mm -hmm. could you tell us what the ethics premium is and what is it for 2023? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and it is it is so much fun, Tom, because it, it is something that we have been we have been tracking this for about a decade now. And what we wanted to do with the ethics premium was really put some numbers behind our theory that a good ethics is good business. And we wanted to give our ethics and compliance community a tool to say, no, this is not a cost center. There is a financial benefit from having these kinds of programs. We hired an index firm. And they work with us to every year when we pull the list together, we send them the list of publicly traded companies that are on the world's most ethical companies list for that year. It's during the quiet period where companies know that they're on the list, but we haven't disclosed it yet. So there's being on the list is not causing any share movement in any way, shape or form. And they look back over a five-year period and they look at the financial performance of those companies. This year, there's 79 of the 135 that are publicly traded and they figure out how those companies performed from a stock price perspective compared to a comparable global index. And every year, Tom, they, that group has outperformed and this year's outperformance is 13.6%. So it is a statistically significant level of outperformance during a very turbulent market period over the course of 2022. It's a five-year look back, but really if you look at the chart, there's a lot of noise in the market over the course of the last year, for sure. And yet we see these kinds of companies who care about their people, who care about the communities in which they operate, who are thinking long term as a business, they outperform consistently. And we have the data to show it. So to everybody out there who says, I can't care about my people and do well, I can't care about my communities and do well, I can't think for the long term and do well, I say, really? <laughs> Because that's not what our data says. The first time I saw this number, it was 4.5%. And when I saw that number, I became very, because the first, first of all, it was the first time I'd seen an ethics premium number. But two, it struck me, that's real money. That's real stock value. That's real price. Yep. We're a lot further along than 4.5. And the, so maybe the last thing I'd like to emphasize is it's really not, the 4.5, and it may even not be the 13.6, but it's the steady continued of companies who have the Ethisphere, world's most ethical companies designation. And over time, that compounding factor is going to be a huge increase 
in value to all of the stakeholders of an organization. Yep, absolutely. And Tom, I would say that it really correlates to the kind of practices that land a company on this list. Because every time I get, every time I present on the ethics premium, I have somebody say to me, well, what's the causation? And I'm not saying that I necessarily have specific causation. What we have is we have a decade's worth of correlation. And I would point your listeners to three pieces that I think drive the ethics premium. One is the average company's value today, 80% of it is in What's the biggest piece of your intangible value? Your people. What kind of practices do we measure as part of the ethics quotient process? Your people practices, right? Are you empowering managers to create environments where people are comfortable speaking up? Are you showing your people how to do business the way you want them to be doing business? Are you picking third-party partners that share your values and are going to keep you out of trouble? Those are the kinds of practices that land a company on the list. And those are the kinds of things that I would say really support the, in, the, the protection of the intangible value of your enterprise. Second thing I would say is a lot of the companies on our list are thinking for the long term, and the companies on our list tend to have put a lot of thought into their social license to operate and what animates their mission as a business. And they have hooked that mission to the way they talk about and think about their programs. And so those are some of the things that I think really go into the magic that is now the decade's worth of data we have on the ethics premium. I can't think of a better way to end this podcast, so I'm going to say thank you very much. But before we leave, if our listeners wanted more information on the world's most ethical companies for 2023, where can they go, Erica? So two places you can go. One is worldsmostethicalcompanies.com, which is the honoree-focused website that we've created. If you want to see who's on the list for this year and get it, read our FAQs about the process, we go into a lot of detail about our methodology there. The other thing I would say is give Sphere's LinkedIn account a follow on LinkedIn because we are going to be writing about what the data tells us over the course of the next couple of months. And of course, gearing up for World's Most Ethical Companies 2024, which will open midsummer from a process perspective. Eric, I wanted to thank you again for taking the time from your very busy day to speak with me. And I look forward to continuing this conversation. It's always a pleasure, Tom. One of my is getting a chance to chat with you. So thanks so much.